think no, the, what troubles me concerning the philosophy of science nowadays is the resistance uh, to learning new things. Let me give you another personal anecdote. Three or four years ago, I wrote a paper on inverse programs. Inverse programs are all the rage among physicists and among engineers nowadays. Uh, nine years ago, no, ten years ago, the first international congress of inverse programs uh, met in Hong Kong. And so I wrote a paper and sent it around to the main journals in computer science. Projected, they never heard about <coughs> inverse problems. If they never heard, they cannot exist. And yet, we, are, we, we meet them uh, every day. For instance, I try to guess what you are thinking uh, from your gestures. Um, the <coughs> medical doctor uh, who reads your symptoms are uh, symptoms of something that. He cannot see, so he has to conjecture, he has to, to solve the problem of what is, what are the causes, the possible causes, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I worked in, <clears throat> when I first started uh, doing physics, nuclear physics, uh, the problems I, I faced were inverse problems. Trying to find out uh, what happens uh, is the, in the collision between, let's say, the protons uh, just from the way they are scattered from one another. Uh, that's a typical best uh, problem. The engineer who is asked to produce a device that will design a device that will produce such and such an effect. He's given this effect, he has to invent the cause. Every inference or every conjecture from effects to causes is uh, a solution to inverse problem. So they are the most difficult ones. Sometimes they have no solutions, but other times they have many more than one solution. So they are the most interesting and so they should they should appeal to philosophers because of the difficulty. No, they don't exist. And one of the referees said, oh yes, luck at us in such a such place that that was no. What Dr. Cutters <laughs> did was to deal with a totally different problem, namely uh, the truth by reduction to absurdity. But it has not, nothing to do with But given what you say about uh, philosophers of science, isn't it a good thing that they have very little influence, that very few scientists, social scientists, care at all about yeah. philosophy of science? Yeah. And as a consequence of that remoteness, philosophers usually contribute very little, if anything, to the development of science. For instance, uh, philosophers have almost uh, <clears throat> unanimously they've rejected the old Hippocratic idea that uh, mental events are brain events. Um, most of them adopted dualism. Like uh, Descartes and even mm -hmm. Popper, of course. And as a consequence, they were really the philosophers had been obstacles to the transformation of psychology into cognitive neuroscience. Uh, fortunately, uh, medical psychology paid no attention to philosophers. Oh, but uh, eventually, cognitive neuroscience was born about 80 years ago. Uh, as, a, as a going concern, and nowadays it is the most prolific uh, approach to, to psychological problems. But you know who, who uh, is almost without exception um, opposed to the idea that uh, neuropsychology may have implications for social life? Oh, yeah. All sociologists. <laughs> no. Sociologists will will not uh, no, accept, they, no. they say, okay, you can do that, but no. it does not affect what we do. Well, this is changing, this is changing. It has been changing for the past 30 years. There Among is, sociologists? They, they, yeah, they, it's now recognized that there is such thing as social cognitive neuroscience. This is changing. 
uh, it is recognized as a branch of, of neuroscience. Yes, but it does not contain any sociologists. Oh, no, no, it hasn't reached the sociology. Sociology has, has still uh, to learn about that. But, um, <clears throat> no, they ref but, but they refuse as well. Yeah, they, yeah. And, and well, well, but uh, this uh, beginning, you know, and uh, for instance, it is now well known that uh, oppression uh, causes, has psychological effects that people, to such an extent that people get sick. Uh, there is a famous uh, <clears throat> study, the so called Whitehall study, uh, has two parts really, right? So that's like one and Whitehall study two. A study of the uh, health and the mortality of the uh, civil servants in England. There are many of them, like thousands of them are concentrated in the big building in London called Whitehall. And so they show that although all the civil servants have access to the same uh, health services, they all have permanent jobs so that they are not anxious at about the, <clears throat> the stability of the jobs, and they all earn quite well. The fact is that those on top live several years more than those below, and those in the, in the lower ranks of the hierarchy um, have the highest, uh, the highest rate of, of sickness. And uh, so, in other words, the lack of freedom or oppression makes you sick, makes you know, physically sick. Mm -hmm. And so, the, the mechanism is, is, is quite well known, but namely that stress, social stress in this particular case, uh, the inability to, to disobey others to escape the net, the network, uh, produces stress in society which increases the rate of production of cortisol. And cortisol goes to the whole organism and uh, it really kills cells. So it, it, it sickens people. And uh, so here you have a number of levels a number of aspects, uh, social, biological, psychological, etc. Uh, and so, this is an argument for freedom and moral work for self management rather than for the hierarchical, hierarchical organizations. If you manage your own affairs or they have an intervention, you, you can <coughs> contribute to the organization of your own work, you feel less constrained less oppressed, and so you get less sick. So the, the idea is that workers mm -hmm. in a cooperative get less sick than workers in the, in the usual uh, business firm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still an open question, though, whether uh, all forms of subordination uh, are bad for the organism or the person that is on the lower rung. There may be some that, uh, I mean, in light of the fact that uh, a high level of individualism and with it often social isolation um, creates a lot of stress yeah. as well. Um, and so I, I guess a more fine grained kind of understanding is necessary uh, because the, the, the very isolated but not formally subordinated yeah. person may, may be much. Well, more st uh, stress uh, than uh, 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 precisely. Uh, you have the voluntary organizations, the NGOs. You know, they don't have a hierarchical uh, organization. Everyone takes the part of the, in the design of the policies and the discussion of the day-to-day -day work and so on. So forth. Uh, they are all equal. <coughs> there are no bosses. And no one owns anything. Uh, they are collective enterprises. And people are happy working there. 
NGOs, not all NGOs. Mm -hmm. You mean cooperatives or? Yeah, cooperatives. Cooperatives or all, all kinds. Mm -hmm. Cooperatives that are enterprises for, for profit, for, for profit enterprises, like the famous Mondragon, Mondragon in, in the Basque country, or uh, non profit organizations such as the Salvation Army, our uh, clubs, and uh, the steel unions and so on and so forth. Of course, there, there are fast, there are always conflicts over power and things like that. But they can be resolved peacefully and, and never in an authoritarian way. So you have to earn mm -hmm. your the, the rank if there is any rank. You have to earn it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, the idea we started asking what can Philosophers continue. Well, philosophers are quite good at very little. You find something in physics. They have contributed practically nothing to the conundrums of quantum physics. Quantum physics has faced philosophical problems for nearly one century. It was born in 1825, and from the start, from the start, the fathers of quantum physics, Warren Heisenberg, adopted a positive Neo positives and dogma. Maybe the theories have to represent only appearances, uh, measurement results, in like that. And uh, as uh, Heisenberg said in his autobiography, that an, an atom is a, a concept that occurs in a description of an observation or a measurement. There are no atoms out there. Mm. And um, philosophers have. Uh, in this particular case, they have been too subservient. They have believed whatever nonsense a scientist said instead of criticizing it from the start. Of course, Marxist philosophers did protest that on the completely wrong because they misunderstood. They thought that these theories, relativity and quantum theory, were very subjectivistic in thought. But what subjectivistic was a particular interpretation of the way given. <coughs> but certain physicists to their own theories. And uh, so the, the Marxist philosophers also contributed to <coughs> the lack of understanding to obscure this debate. And uh, for instance, uh, 30 years ago, there were these famous experiments on entanglement uh, by uh, Alain Aspect and, and others. And uh, so philosophers said, oh, realism has been refuted. They have adopted the faulty definition that, that Einstein had given of realness, of real thing or evidence of reality, and of realism. For Einstein, 